Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar sponsored by Autoglass. My name is Sarah, and I'm the Senior Fleet Officer here at Brick and part of Brick's global fleet team, where we work with fleet operators and suppliers to share resources and best practice across the industry. Good maintenance is essential to ensure vehicles being driven for work, whether company or employee owned, are safe on the roads. Regular checking and servicing, particularly of safety critical components, such as brakes and tyres, can fix small problems early on, eliminating the need for expensive repairs down the line and avoiding costly insurance claims. This webinar today will outline the consequences of non-compliance with vehicle standards, how to educate and train drivers to complete routine vehicle checks, and how to verify the standards of technicians working on your vehicles. You should all now be able to see my presentation and hear the audio alongside it. As attendees, you are all muted, so you don't need to worry about any background noise from your offices. There will be an opportunity for you to ask questions towards the end of the webinar, and there are two ways in which you can do this. Firstly, there is a chat box on the webinar panel where you can send your question at any point during the webinar. Secondly, there is a raise hand icon on the same panel. You can press this during the Q&A session at the end of today's presentations, and we will unmute you, and you can put your question to the panel then directly over the phone. Today we will be hearing presentations from John Eastman at the Society of Operations Engineers who will be discussing industry best practice and ensuring your vehicles are roadworthy. David Lawrence from Verizon Connect will be discussing how you can use telematics data to assess vehicle health and anticipate maintenance needs. Jeremy Rochefort from Autoglass who will be discussing windscreen sensor recalibration and Chris Weeks from NBRA who will be discussing how to ensure the technician working on your vehicle has the integrity and technical competence to carry out your repairs. But before we begin, let me tell you about Brick. Set up and founded in 1995, Brick is a national road safety charity that exists to stop the needless deaths and serious injuries that happen on roads every day. Make streets and communities safer for everyone and care for families bereaved and injured in road crashes. Brick's vision is quite simple, a world that has zero road deaths and injuries in a world where people can get around in ways that are safe, sustainable, fair and healthy. We promote road safety awareness, safe and sustainable road use and effective road safety policies through campaigns, community education, information and advice for organisations operating fleets of vehicles and road safety professionals. And of course, by running the UK's flagship road safety event, Road Safety Week. We also provide essential support to people across the UK devastated by road death and serious injury to help them in their darkest hours. So in terms of support, we run a quality accredited free phone helpline in the UK for people bereaved and seriously injured in road crashes. You can see some information on the level of support we gave in 2017 on your screen now. In addition to the helpline, we also provide support literature and work very closely with police forces throughout the UK so that when someone does receive that knock on the door from a family liaison officer, they're providing them with best practice support literature. We campaign nationally and regionally to raise awareness among the public and to lobby government and push for change in road safety legislation. An example of this is our 2016 Roads to Justice campaign, which centred around getting justice for bereaved families. This UK campaign launched outside Parliament and gained a lot of media attention, and I'm sure most of you will have seen the changes to criminal driving sentencing announced in October 2017. And we are now, of course, lobbying the UK government to make sure those changes are introduced. We also do a lot of campaigning more generally on raising awareness of a range of topics, some of which you can see on the screen now. Awareness raising and education in communities is delivered through projects such as Road Safety Week, the UK's flagship road safety event, which you can find more information about by watching our latest webinar on our YouTube channel and visiting roadsafetyweek.org.uk. Each year, Brick helps hundreds of companies run road safety projects in their communities and inspire children to be safe on our roads. We have well-established events and resources to help you run activities locally to your business and our community engagement team can help put you in touch with local schools and nurseries and give you advice on how to talk to different age groups or your company can work with Brick to establish your very own community project. We also share training tools and guidance on global fleet safety best practice for our Brick professional membership service. We provide our members with tools to manage occupational road risk regardless of budget, fleet size or vehicle type. We run an annual calendar of events, including webinars such as today's and seminars and training throughout the year. And we also have annual flagship events such as our Fleet Safety Conference and Fleet Safety Awards. 
In addition to these events, we also produce a lot of resources for employers, including guidance reports on introducing policies and sharing best practice case studies. Alongside that, we provide employers with tools to use directly with their drivers. You can see on the screen now some of the posters, infographics and videos which you can use to engage your own drivers. I would now like to welcome John Eastman from the Society of Operations Engineers. Thank you. My name is John Eastman. I'm Chair of the Institute of Road Transport Engineers Professional Sector Council and I also sit on the Technical Committee as the Chairman as well. I'm going to speak to you today on maintenance and mechanics and how safe are your vehicles. Anybody that runs vehicles, operates vehicles, whether it be an owner, a user, whether you're hiring or renting vehicles for hire or reward, there is a need for a number of regulations to be followed. One, of course, is to have an operator's license that allows you to run those vehicles. And on that operator's license, having completed it correctly and shown that you have enough money in the bank, are of good repute and you have responsible people looking after the vehicles, then you would have signed a declaration of intent to comply with all the regulations associated with it. And normally you would have a, a CPC holder as well to ensure that anything that is on the O license is followed. O license is all about compliance, which in itself means operating vehicles safely. The declaration is about the intent and promise to maintain vehicles and trailers to a safe level and be roadworthy at all times. And that is what the statement is. And preventative maintenance is the way to ensure that those vehicles are inspected on a regular basis for all the vital points on vehicles. And that is what safety is all about in operator license terms. So preventative maintenance is key to ensuring a good, safe fleet of vehicles. As part of the declaration, they are asking you to inspect vehicles at regular frequencies. And remember that preventative maintenance is all about finding the fault before it goes wrong. The inspections should be carried out by a competent person that's been trained on how to inspect a vehicle to a good standard and be up to date on all legislation. There are a number of initiatives out there and the DVSA inspectors have all been checked by what the IRTE classify as an ERTEC license. That means they're competent and been trained to inspect vehicles in a methodical and competent manner. As part of that and of the O license is the need to ensure that the vehicles visit the workshops at the agreed frequency. And that would depend upon most certainly the type of operation, the type of vehicle, whether it's double shifted, whether it goes on landfill, on road, off road, that will determine as to the frequency because of the different variations in usage. And the documentation that's used should cover all the aspects associated with the MOT test and all those numbers are listed and the documentation should list each of those where the technician doing the inspection can in fact tick them off as being checked and seen as roadworthy, serviceable or indeed in need, in need of attention or adjustment. On part of the uh, inspection sheet of course is if you find anything wrong and the customer should want their vehicle back without having that particular item repaired there should be some means of a disclaimer whether it be written on the inspection sheet or not as to them taking the vehicle without that safety item being attended. Responsibilities. Obviously you need people that have responsibilities and are responsible for compliance to the vehicles and that could be the owner, the operator, the manager or CPC holder and he's the named person and don't of course forget the driver he has responsibilities as well he should be doing daily walk round checks to ensure that normal running visual checks can be done on wheels tires wheel nuts lighting horns and all the other safety requirements that should be in place on the vehicle to ensure that he can do his job safely first line of any problem or fault is between inspections is of course the driver. As part of the driver's check, he should be signing off his daily checks to these as proof of the fact that he has carried them out. Maintenance providers, if you have vehicles and you want them maintained, obviously you can do them in-house. You can have mobile attendants, providing you have the facilities where they can carry that out in a competent, or you can use a provider, a workshop that's an independent, part of an agency, 
or in fact, small guy that runs a small workshop and attends whatever you call him out. Facilities of that workshop should be suitable for the type of vehicles that have running in your fleet. As part of that, the facilities are no good without the right staff and the quality and the competence of the people must be considered when looking at a provider to carry out the maintenance. And it should be done to a, a good quality, have competent technicians and to be of a recognised standard. Competent staff, how to check and be happy with the provider and all the staff that are doing the work and the quality and procedures within that organisation. Let's not forget that the CPC holder is the backstop for anything that goes wrong. The traffic commissioner and all the DVSA will look to the CPC holder as the responsible person. And normally he's the guy that signs the declaration on the operator's license. And he needs a level of comfort to be able to do his normal daily routine parts of his job and know that in the background, the provider he's using for maintaining his vehicles and the provider's technicians are of the right quality and competency to carry out the work that he needs on his vehicles to the right standard. There are a number of publications out there in the marketplace and they are guidance to everybody that operates vehicles. The first one, of course, is the Guide to Roadworthiness, which everybody should be familiar with and should be available in the workshop and or the office to make reference to, to make sure that you are being compliant and in line with guidance laid down by both the DVSA and the traffic commissioners, who are the stakeholders. The IRTE has been involved with the Guide to Roadworthiness and helped put it together, and therefore they are a stakeholder as well. And certainly within the Guide to Roadworthiness, there is mention of a standard for workshops and a standard for technicians, both in quality and competency. And the IRTE, and though this is a plug, the IRTE do workshop accreditation audits, which are recognised by the DVSA as being, and certainly by the traffic commissioners, as being a good step in the right direction to ensure the providers are able to give you the service you want. And having the technicians licensed, having had their competencies checked to ensure that what's being done in the workshop is to a recognised national standard. IRT being one of those that offers that facility. Having looked at all those areas and looked at working safely, having your vehicle safe, having the right people in place and using the correct providers, hopefully means that you've got an efficient operation and an effective maintenance procedure. That means that you are compliant and complying with everything within the O license. And at the end of the day, that which is what this presentation is all about, the vehicles being safe and the safe being the operative word and meeting compliance and having good maintenance, competent engineers and inspectors. And at the end of the day, safe vehicles in which to carry out your work. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much to John there from the Society of Engineers for that really useful presentation. Lots of clear practical advice there, which I'm sure you'll agree with, for us all to take on board. So we'll now hear from David Lawrence at Verizon Connect. Thanks to the break team for organising today's webinar. The subject of utilising telematics for proactive maintenance is an ever-evolving topic. Some of the content I cover off of this presentation may be news to some of you, or if you've been keeping a close watch on telematics, and it might serve as a reminder on what to plan for in your business today. In either case, I hope that one of your main takeaways is that a well-maintained fleet is a safer fleet. Well-maintained fleets can have a number of benefits compared to fleets where maintenance might be considered an annoying afterthought. Preventing mechanical failures can help keep vehicles downtime to a minimum, which in turn can keep your field-based staff as efficient and profitable as possible. Often a vehicle off-road can also mean unproductive staff time, creating a double whammy for your company's bottom line. It's also common sense to most that practicing preventative or proactive maintenance can help lower the chance of failure, which in turn helps to bring down overall service maintenance and repair budgets. And last, but by no means least, a well-maintained vehicle can also reduce the likelihood of failures that might result in incidents, which can have catastrophic effects on your drivers and other road users. All good reasons then to practice proactive maintenance. So what can telematics do to help? Hopefully most of you know the main benefits of telematics in terms of where to find your drivers, how it can help to lower your fuel costs and how it helps to make your drivers safer by improving driver habits. What you may not know is that for a considerable portion of the hardware fitted to telematics enabled vehicles, there are additional data streams that provide information on vehicle health. 
Sadly, much of this information goes to waste as most telematics providers simply don't know how to interpret the data produced. There are therefore two camps of telematics providers who can give you data to assess vehicle health. And I'll give you some insight into both. First, and by their very nature, the budget offerings can give you limited information when it comes to helping with anticipating your maintenance needs. You can, however, still use some of the information if you have responsible, a reasonable grasp of the management reporting functions. The most salient information surrounds mileage capture. By tracking vehicle miles covered, you should get a reasonably accurate idea of where your vehicles will reach the manufacturer's service window. By tracking this information, it's easy to make predictions as to when to book vehicles in for service and therefore plan for vehicles to be off-road without affecting your field-based staff. By doing so, you can help ensure they are still productive. Also, staying within the manufacturer's service schedule should increase your chances of avoiding failures down the line and ensure that those safety checks that can't be done on quick daily inspections are fully completed with any remedial repairs being actioned. It's also worth considering that MPG reports can be compared over time which can show reductions in performance and likely indicate degradation. If your telematics has fuel card integration, then this can be further corroborated by investigating historical data. It's also worth noting that some vehicles are prone to a lot more wear and tear than would be evident at first glance. Traditionally, we measure the timings for service and maintenance by either time or mileage. This may work for the majority of vehicles, but for some engine hours is what really counts. Telematic systems can use this additional measure as an indication of servicing needs for vehicles that have power takeoff, such as vans running pumps or generating power to machinery, cherry pickers or construction equipment, etc. All these different assets may have relatively low mileage, but still require maintenance as regularly as they're like commercial vehicle cousins. Having this data to hand and accessible from the cloud without having to inspect each and every one on site gives fleet managers valuable and timely insight required for proactive maintenance. The second and increasingly relevant telematics camp is the OEM or auto manufacturer built in offerings. Most manufacturers have either started to offer plug in or embedded hardware. If their models don't yet offer this option, then they are likely planning to have their own embedded telematics hardware. For the more technically minded among you, this is connected through either the OBD tube port, or at least for a little while longer, or more directly to the CAN bus. It is worth noting that aftermarket plug and play hardware will decline over the next few years as OEM shut off the access to these OBD2 ports, mainly for security reasons. It's not essential to know what that means, but if you know a little bit about vehicle servicing, then it tells you there is a way of communicating with a vehicle's brain. What this in turn means is that you have the ability to find out health of your vehicle. What's important here is that vehicle health information is a key to proactive vehicle maintenance. Even now, for a number of manufacturers, you can start to report on diagnostic trouble codes or DTCs for short. These fault codes combined with information on warning lights can highlight impending problems such as engine health, low oil or ABNU levels, etc. If you know a particular fault code is reporting and actually know what it means, you can turn this into actual information. Now, you would hope that drivers would notice something as simple as low oil, but many fleet managers can tell you stories of vehicles where dashboard lights have been ignored. With full vehicle health reporting, you can now be confident that low oil is now a simple matter of talking to the driver and having them top it up. You can also check to ensure this has been done. Obviously, left unattended low oil ultimately can lead to engine failure and the direct cost of replacement unit, plus the indirect cost of having a vehicle off-road with downtime for staff and lost business productivity. Likewise, small electrical problems can often go unnoticed for days weeks or even months. Remedial action may be as simple as a quick reset or a small change in hardware. Left unattended, these minor problems can balloon into more far-reaching issues, with again associated costs of vehicle and driver off-road. So how are we supposed to interpret all this wealth of new information? As with any of the other advantages to telematics, there needs to be some common sense rules applied to the data provided. Don't get bogged down with every last full code. Pick the ones that are most likely to indicate an imminent failure or are safety related. This takes time and patience at the start, but you can take advantage of the knowledge and experience that your OEM provider has to guide you along the way. Also having a relationship with your supplying or servicing dealer who can give you the best advice on what is urgent or safety related to give you the tools required to prioritize and plan your service and maintenance schedules. Use actual mileage to better predict service requirements. It's a sad fact that not all your drivers might be 100% honest about the use of their company property but some of them may have permission to use the vehicle for private purposes out of hours. But if not, it has been known for drivers 
is to remove hardware and plug it back in later on. This is difficult for factory fit hardware, but relatively easy for plug and play solutions. What drivers may not know is that OEM solutions often record odometer mileage as well as miles covered. So you can see an additional miles covered as soon as hardware is plugged back in again. Lastly, especially because this is a great webinar, it's worth mentioning the additional safety features that come with knowing the health of the vehicle. With OEM solutions, you can monitor things like tire pressure, ABS faults, seatbelt usage, and airbag warning lights, or activation. All of these alerts will help to ensure that you and your drivers are both driving safely and in safe vehicles, which might help you sleep a little better at night. So in summary, what have we learned today? All telematics can give you important information that can help you to run a better maintained, more reliable, and safer fleet. Look out for the new wave of OEM telematics solution that can give you vehicle health and safety information. On this point, a quick question that often comes up is, what if I run a multi or open badge fleet? OEMs themselves only provide the hardware. In most cases, you'll be given a number of supplier platforms to choose from. Do your research and find the one that has links to the OEMs you deal with. My one little plug for Horizon here is that we specialize in OEM integrations and currently lead the market with a number of OEM connections we manage. If you want to know more, please ask the organisers for my details and I'll be delighted to tell you more after the event. Last but not least, a little advice we have gleaned over the years. If you want to take advantage of the benefits that telematics can bring to your business, be very clear about your goals and motivation so that you can get the most out of it for your organisation. Be clear about your desired outcomes and find a system that best suits your needs now and in the future. Thank you very much to David there from Verizon Connect for that really insightful presentation on how you can use telematics to ensure the maintenance of your vehicles. And I'm pleased to say that David will be joining us for the live Q&A later as well. Next up, um, we have Jeremy Rochefort presenting on behalf of Autoglass, who are kindly sponsoring today's webinar. Thank you. Welcome everyone to this break webinar on the topic of maintenance and mechanics and why it's so important for vehicle safety. My name is Jeremy Rochfort and I am the National Sales Manager for Autoglass. The purpose of today's presentation is to give you an overview of the active safety systems available today in many vehicles and why it's so important that this technology is well maintained. I'll be talking in some detail about windscreen mounted sensor calibration, but we'll also give you a few insights into the current market trends relating to advanced driver assistance systems generally known as ADAS, and explain what you should be looking out for when getting your vehicles repaired. I'll then cover off some useful best practice for fleet decision makers. So we'll start with a quick video, which reinforces what we mean by ADAS and shows how these systems are now present on many vehicles today. The term ADAS is used to, to describe active safety systems on a vehicle that can identify safety critical situations and take action to avoid or reduce the severity of a crash, either automatically or by sending a warning to the driver. I'm talking about things like lane deviation warning systems, which make your steering wheel vibrate if you try to change lane without indicating. The systems support many different safety features including automatic emergency braking and lane deviation warning. ADAS is becoming a standard feature in many fleets and the technology is advancing rapidly, thanks in part to sensor technologies such as cameras, radar and laser, also referred to as LIDAR. 
Front-facing cameras on the windscreen are one of the most common sensors that ADAS safety features rely on to function correctly. For example, to detect pedestrians, cyclists, road signs and lane markings. You probably haven't seen them, but cameras can also be mounted on the reverse of the rear view mirror. And there are a few examples of these cameras shown on the slide. So why does calibration matter? Well, many vehicle manufacturers recommend that cameras are recalibrated if the windscreen is replaced. However, it is recommended that you should get the cameras checked in all of the listed circumstances. Cameras need to know where they are mounted in relation to the vehicle so that the coordinates of other objects can be correctly measured. Vehicle manufacturers recognize that ADAS systems are key to improve safety on their vehicles and the correct functionality of the sensors is key to the continued safety performance of the ADAS systems. Because the forward-facing camera or cameras are attached to or mounted close to the windscreen, when the glass is changed, then the view of the camera may change slightly, either because the mounting bracket has a slightly different lateral or angular position, or the glass has a slightly different shape or optical properties. Because of these slight within tolerance changes, the vehicle manufacturers recognize and mandate the need for a calibration after a windscreen replacement. A camera that is misaligned by as little as one degree can have devastating consequences. For example, a one degree misalignment in pitch angle may significantly change the camera's view of the road further ahead. And this can have implications in terms of detecting objects in the road for automatic emergency braking. Let's look at some of the trends in ADAS today and in the future. The speed at which these systems have appeared on the market and the huge range of different products available have presented challenges for drivers, fleet operators, dealers, insurers and the vehicle aftermarket. As recently as 2015, just over 2% 2 of windscreen replacements performed by Autoglass needed ADAS calibration but this figure continues to increase dramatically. Today, Autoglass completes an ADAS calibration on over 7% of all windscreen replacements, and this is forecast to rise to 40% by 2020, with fleet vehicles 50% more likely to have been fitted with ADAS than other vehicles on the road. Everyone recognizes that autonomy will deliver safer roads by removing humans from the driving process. ADAS is a step in the journey to autonomy. ADAS is starting to take some of the decision making and action away from the driver by taking control in certain circumstances. Organizations with a key focus on road safety, such as Euro NCAP, are accelerating the adoption of ADAS systems. ADAS market penetration is growing and camera penetration is growing exponentially. What does this mean for fleets? Since fleet cars tend to be newer and come with up-to-date safety features, the adoption rate of ADAS in these vehicles is much higher. A recent survey of 250 British fleet managers by Autoglass found that just over a third, 34%, of the vehicles in car and van fleets already have some ADAS-enabled safety features, such as automatic emergency braking and lane deviation warnings. Based on these findings, it is estimated that 29% of all car fleets and 40% of all van and light commercial fleet vehicles are now ADAS enabled. However, whilst ADAS is growing significantly, keeping up to date with technology ranks low down on fleet decision maker priorities. Our research also found that while managers responsible for ADAS equipped car and van fleets appear to recognize some of the benefits of the technology, including improved driver safety, 47%, and reductions in repair costs, 23%, a significant number surveyed acknowledged their lack of awareness on how the technology works. There is a danger that if the technology is working incorrectly or is not used to the fullest extent of its benefits, ADAS could present as many risks to road safety as they solve. It is essential that fleets ensure that the technology is correctly fitted and clear instructions on the use of ADAS are given to the driver and other relevant stakeholders and that drivers aren't switching their ADAS systems off. 
SBD estimates that 59% of ADAS owners regularly turn off forward collision warnings and 57% do the same with lane departure warnings. In the future, ADAS checks may be incorporated into a periodical technical inspection proposed in the EU as a replacement for the MOT. Until then, many fleets rely on vehicle dealerships for expert knowledge of their manufacturer's proprietary technologies. However, there is evidence that their expertise may be patchy. One secret shopper exercise conducted by consultancy strategy analytics using real-world potential buyers found that in some cases, no insight on new advanced safety and infotainment features was offered. In other situations during the exercise, sales representatives were confused and features were misrepresented during test drives. Research by Autoglass in 2016 also revealed that 31% of UK dealerships were unaware of the need to calibrate ADAS technology and 53% gave inaccurate information on the technology available. The wider industry must find new ways to play an active role in educating drivers about complex technologies. To ensure drivers receive a clear and accurate picture of the many ADAS systems already on the market, the industry, including manufacturers, should aim to communicate the value of autonomous technologies, explaining what each system is capable of, including its limitations, the benefits of using them and how drivers can maximize the value of active safety. From a fleet perspective, it is essential that decision makers ensure the technology is correctly fitted and clear instructions on the use of ADAS are given to the driver and other relevant stakeholders. It's up to you to educate your drivers and that the correct systems are selected for your fleet. So what can fleets do to take action on ADAS? Here are our five recommendations. Number one, understand what systems features you have and want in your fleet. The variety of products and features available on the market is wide and selection should take usage into consideration and should be selected with the ultimate aim of minimizing road risk for your drivers and vehicles. Driver manuals should state clearly what technology is on board. Two. Make sure drivers are ADAS aware. Drivers need to be aware of the ADAS functionality and how the technology works. Consider what training tools are available to ensure that drivers develop the appropriate behaviors and attitudes towards ADAS enabled safety technology. Three, make sure drivers aren't switching off. Fleet managers should communicate a clear policy to drivers to prevent technology being switched off. Four, Make sure you have a process in place for calibration. Many manufacturers recommend that ADAS are calibrated during repair and maintenance, including after a windscreen replacement. However, 20% of ADAS-enabled car fleet managers and 15% of van fleet managers surveyed by Autoglass admitted that they do not include ADAS calibration as part of their checks during vehicle repair and maintenance. Five. Make sure your ADAS is looked after by qualified technicians. There's a few things we suggest considering when choosing who looks after your calibration. Can the technicians carry out static and dynamic calibrations? And I'll explain the difference between those in my next slide. Do they know when a calibration should be carried out? And can they calibrate radars and lidars? What technology and equipment are they using? And what training do they receive? For example, are they IMI accredited? In October 2015, Autoglass launched an ADAS calibration solution, having invested significantly in understanding these technologies and using that understanding to develop a technical and customer solution. There are two main forms of calibration, dynamic and static. Static calibration requires a controlled environment where the vehicle cannot move whereas dynamic calibration requires the vehicle to be driven to complete the calibration process. Autoglass offers both static and dynamic calibration solutions, and the calibration is performed during the same appointment as the windscreen replacement. Autoglass has a national network of 54 centers to provide static calibrations, and our dynamic calibration service is carried out at a location convenient for the fleet driver 
saving driver and vehicle downtime. In summary, ADAS is a growing issue and the calibration process is becoming more complicated as the technology on cars increases, but awareness amongst drivers and fleet decision makers is really low. Hopefully this presentation has been useful in helping to explain ADAS and the importance of calibration and how we all have a role to play in ensuring driver safety and reducing risk for all road users. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much to Jeremy there from today's sponsors Autoglass. That was a really interesting presentation with lots of useful information to take there um, about ADAS and recalibration. So thank you very much again. And we will now hear from Chris Weeks um, from the National Body Repairs Association. Thank you. Okay, um, my name is Chris Weeks. Um, I'm the director of the National Body Repair Association. I've been asked to talk about the, the, the problems that people have, consumers have with choosing a body shop and how to ensure that the, you know, especially how to ensure that, that the technicians working on your vehicle uh, has the integrity and technical competence to carry out the repairs on, on one of your cars. I'll probably start with why is uh, choosing a body shop such a difficult thing. Initially, it's difficult due to the control that insurance companies typically have over, you know, where repairs go. And the insurer will typically try to push or, or suggest that the customer uses one of their uh, approved repairers. And, and why do they do this? And it's because the insurers tend to have preferential rates agreed with a network of typically about 100, 150 different repairers. They believe that this will give them a competitive advantage over other insurers, you know, due to the, the rates that they have agreed with them, their preferential rates. And they may even, surprisingly, make profit out of your repair uh, if it happens to be that wasn't the customer's own fault, which, it, which will come as a surprise to a lot of people. But in reality, that is, that is the truth. So insurers will work very, very hard to convert a customer uh, to use one of their own repairers. If the customer or the policyholder uh, reads the terms and conditions of their insurance policy, they will often find they have no choice where the repair is carried out. So some insurers don't simply don't give you any choice at all about where your car can be repaired. They Some will put in barriers to you choosing your own repairer, such as, uh, for example, an increased excess, or they may say that your uh, car repair will be delayed if you don't use one of their, their repairers, or, or they may say that you might not benefit from certain services such as a courtesy car for, for whilst it's re being repaired. So what, what do customers need to do? Well, really, you know, number one, uh, <laughs> buyer beware, it's the usual thing. Always read the small print when you're taking out an insurance policy. Uh, make sure that you do have some freedom. Discuss things that relate to repair when you're purchasing the policy. So do ask whether you have a choice um, and whether you're able to be able to choose your own repairer. And, and in my opinion, or the MBRA's opinion, it, it is important that consumers do have the right to choose themselves. What are the things that you need to be considering when repairing modern vehicles? Are they difficult to repair? Well, in short, yes, they are. Modern vehicles are crammed with modern technology and electronics, uh, which you may or may not have heard of, including things such as ADAS, uh, some will have radar, LIDAR, cameras, etc., all built into the safety systems of their car. They're far more complex to repair than they used to be. And in many instances, you know, specialist training and specialist equipment is required to repair cars. Yeah, it's almost getting to the point where, you know, as I've said here in the presentation, that in, in, at some future time, it might be essential or necessary that a damaged vehicle is actually returned to the manufacturer's approved body shop. Increasingly, we are seeing uh, repairers having the inability to repair cars properly, and there's there's lots of evidence of this in the market. And many of our members have, you know, reported seeing vehicles coming in that have been previously repaired to a, a very poor standard. So I guess that the message is to be aware, and policyholders must read the the small print and realize. So, you know, when a car has been involved in an incident, perhaps even a crash, um, some insurers will insist on non-original parts being used. Often these are fine. Um, they can come off the same production line as the parts that end up with the manufacturer. But also in many other instances, they're not the same uh, and they may be made of completely different materials. 
Good examples of this are sort of bonnets uh, and bumper beams that on the original vehicle may be made of aluminium. Um, and this is for uh, pedestrian safety and also for weight saving, but could actually be replaced with a steel part which performs completely different in an incident and may affect the pedestrian or the occupant of the vehicle. In short, um, non-original parts could, not necessarily, but could jeopardise the safe working um, of the many complex electronic systems that sit in a vehicle. So I guess the, the message again is be aware of what you're buying when you're purchasing an insurance policy. Inform yourself and ask the appropriate questions at, at, the, point of, at the point of sale. There's two key ways to ensure the technical competence and integrity um, of a body repair technician is covered. One of them is that the body shop is manufacturer approved. You know, for example, if it's, you've got a Mercedes and um, you have the vehicle sent to a Mercedes approved repairer. This is not an absolute guarantee um, because some manufacturers have better body repair programs than the others, but you know, almost certainly they would fit manufacturers approved parts on your vehicle after an incident. So that's probably a pretty good bet. Another way to look at ensuring that the integrity of the technicians is that the uh, the repairer that looks at your vehicle subscribes to the international standard BS10125. This is the body shop standard that assures a, a great number of things really. So it's probably the best assurance that a consumer would have right now that their vehicle is going to be repaired properly. BS10125 uh, means that the vehicle will be repaired to manufacturer's standards. And this standard is audited um, thoroughly twice a year. So a little bit more about the standard. Um, as I say, it's a strict audited administrative standard for the control and operation of a body shop. Um, it assures best practice, correct equipment and repair methods are used by technicians, and the technicians are competent in all areas of repair. So things like health and safety are observed. It will ensure that the equipment used to re repair your vehicle after an incident is well maintained. The technicians are appropriately trained on your vehicle. And, and this standard uh, has dramatically, I would say, uh, improved the, the quality of repair standards in the industry, which is, which is very, very important. There's two areas to look at the, uh, the technical competence of the technician as well. So, so one off, you know, as I've said, it's essential that the damaged vehicle is directed to a suitably qualified body shop, uh, and it's up to the consumer to satisfy themselves, you know, following this approach, really, that that the body shop has has those sort of capabilities. Much work needs to be done in discussions with the insurance company to ensure they follow the correct repair procedures. So, you know, I don't think there's any harm at the point of uh, notifying the insurer that you've had an incident or perhaps a crash. Do you ask all these questions that the correct repair procedures will be followed, that the that the body shop has suitably qualified staff? Uh, these are conversations that can be had at the, the purchase stage, but also at the point where claim for an incident is made. So what can the NBRA do, the National Body Repair Association? Um, we assure or we ensure that our members are adhere to a set of operating standards which are audited um, on joining the MBRA. So these are very, very similar to BS10125. Um, we are actively out there in the market, uh, the body repair market, uh, encouraging improved standards, improved training. Uh, we offer our members ongoing training uh, and we push that they you know, continuously upskill their staff. And we're also lobbying insurers on these same subjects conducting surveys in the industry um, and feeding back the information that we find to insurers, pushing them to make sure that the standards are adhered to. We also support our members with a, a technical request service. So should uh, a policyholder's vehicle uh, end up at a body shop that belongs to one of our members, they can ask for the manufacturer's methods to be provided to them to ensure that they properly follow uh, the methods that are set out by the manufacturer uh, in terms of the repair of their vehicle. So a bit of a bit of a sort of rush through there, but I hope that's been of of some use to help people with understanding what 
precautions and steps that they can take to ensure that their car gets properly repaired and the technicians that are used are qualified and, and up to the correct standard. Thank you very much. That was Chris Weeks speaking from the National Body Repairs Association. Thank you very much to those of you who are sending questions so far. I'm pleased to say that we are joined by David at Verizon Connect and Jeremy at Autoglass. So David, I will start with you if that's okay. I'm always amazed by how much data you can gain from telematics. Which data streams should fleet managers pay attention to when assessing vehicle health within their fleet? As I said in the presentation, there are a wealth of information that can come from a vehicle that the hardest thing to do really even when you have uh, like an OEM situation is interpreting the data and finding out that the most salient and the most important codes that come from a vehicle clearly things like oil life add blue levels etc which could have a, a catastrophic effect on a vehicle and the cost of repair are, are quite easy to actually monitor the ones that become a little bit more difficult and where um, sometimes you need a bit of help are things like electronic failures. So there are potentially about 3,000 port codes you can get from a typical vehicle. You only really need to pay attention to about 10% of those. And that's why we recommend the OEM solutions because you should be able to get information from your supplying dealer, servicing dealer, and even your third party telematic supplier will be able to interpret that data and to put a meaningful code behind it. And then you can check to see whether it's a safety related one or not. And, you know, and how tightly it is that you, you make a repair as well. Brilliant. Which vehicles do you say are more prone to wear and tear? I don't think that the ones that, that often catch people out, and like I said in the presentation, are ones that potentially have a lot more wear and tear that you don't see. So when we talk about age and mileage restrictions, the ones with power takeoff typically used uh, maybe in construction or, or, or field-based scenarios where power takeoff or generators etc you're running the engine a lot of the time and therefore getting engine wear that wouldn't normally show up because maybe you've had you know the equivalent of twice as much engine use as the mileage would show so as a <laughs> have to be a little bit careful sometimes as a telematics provider because we do see the frequency of replacement and, uh, and failed parts that come from different manufacturers the good news is from their perspective is they often monitor that as well and they use that proactively to develop their vehicles as they go through product life cycle. Thank you. And what are the, the strengths and the weaknesses of plugins or OEM telematics hardware? You have to make use of the information. One of, one of the things that we tell a lot of our customers is it's great that you've chosen a system that has all the information, but you do need to know how to use the information and what information is important to you. So choosing a supplier that will, will guide you through the right things for, for an individual fleet. And, you know, some of that's related to safety, some of it's related to, to cost savings, et cetera. Taking yeah. some best practice from other fleets that have done something similar is always a good idea. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Um, and just one more question for you, if that's okay, David. How can fleet managers optimise service schedules whilst also maintaining their fleet to a high safety standard? The thing with, with optimising there is to make sure that your maintenance schedules are, are booked in in a timely manner. So obviously fleet managers would always know there's a, a bit of a tolerance in terms of a warranty from a manufacturer in terms of when to put a vehicle in. But you can do predictive mileage based on uh, a normal usage of a vehicle. So ideally what you want to do is to have as many vehicles out on the road uh, on any given day or if there are peaks and troughs in your in your work schedules that you make use of, of maintenance time during the the lower um, demand periods so that you're not really affecting your, your productivity as a business brilliant thank you very much so jeremy if it's okay with you we'll come to you next so thank you very much for obviously sponsoring today's webinar and for your really interesting presentation what i'd like to ask is how has autoglass adapted to a wide range of adas that are now available on the market are there any um, different windscreen requirements for certain systems yeah adas has grown significantly over the last two years we launched our own national solution probably uh, over over two years ago now the, the need to actually recalibrate a camera following a windscreen replacement is is growing 
Uh, at the moment, it's about sort of 10% overall, but for some fleets that we um, that we work with, it can be as much as 30%. And there are essentially two types of calibration. There's uh, there's dynamic calibrations where we actually provide the service as part of our mobile replacement work, or there is a, a static calibration process whereby the vehicle has to be taken into one of our control uh, controlled environment workshops. So that's yeah, it's it's a, it's a growing problem. Fleet managers, uh, in our view, need to be kind of made aware of of the need for for ADAS calibrations. It's it's a specialist service that we now provide. So as you did mention there, um, there is obviously a high adoption of ADAS in cars. Is this the same in vans and other commercial vehicles such as H- HGVs? V- vans are similar. There, so there are more and more uh, of these safety features being brought out as standard on uh, on LCVs. Uh, on AG- on HGVs, I, I believe that. Um, some of the ADAS safety features are now mandate, mandatory on all new HGVs. I think from I think it's November uh, last year, or maybe it was the year before. I think all all new HGVs have to have some kind of either lane, lane deviation warning or automatic braking systems. It's a growing problem. Um, on the mention of HGVs, actually, we have had a um, a question come in from Paul, who who has asked, can these sensors be calibrating on site or is this something which needs to be done in a dealer or is it a, a dealer only job is it something that can only be done in the in the in the shop yeah in the garage? I mean, it's, a, it's, it's a great question I mean, we, we don't actually provide an hgv calibration solution at the moment uh, it's something that we're looking to develop so at the moment mm-hmm. our responsibility is to inform the hgv operator of the need to have the camera recalibrated but it needs to be taken back to a dealer okay so you could argue why do you think that keeping technology up to date is sometimes a lower priority for many vehicle owners. I just think there are so many other kind of issues and, and challenges for a fleet manager, you know, costs, safety, yeah. all, all of those things. Yeah, for, for, for me, that this 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 is about awareness. I mean, I think I think what we would recommend fleet managers do is make sure that all of the drivers of the vehicles on a fleet are made aware of ADAS, the functionality that exists within the vehicles and the importance of getting camera recalibrated following a windscreen replacement. Mm-hmm. So you just mentioned raising awareness there within the fleets. How would you recommend raising that awareness in the public, reminding them of the importance of vehicle maintenance, especially for the increasingly more high-tech vehicles, which obviously are now available on the market for, for most people to buy? I mean, I think I probably talk from my own experience. You know, when I when I when I got my new company car, um, I, I don't necessarily get a a proper kind of induction or handover, whether that's directly from a dealership if you're getting it from a dealership, or from a you know a leasing company, for example. That there's yeah. not there's not really a well, as far as my experience goes, a formal handover process where someone takes you through the different functionality on the vehicle, what it's there for, and again mm-hmm. makes people aware that. If you have a windscreen replacement, there is a need sometimes um, if there's a front facing camera to get that recalibrated. No, no, that is um, a really, really valuable point there. I know from events that we've run in the past, kind of the fact that you can't just get in a vehicle and there's not perhaps any guidance or instructions on some of the features. And that has become a common topic that has been raised time and time again, actually. Thank you very much, Jeremy, for that. We've not got any more questions. So what we will do then is I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank you all for joining us here today. Um, I'm, I hope you found today's presentation insightful and useful. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you, of course, to our speakers who again have um, provided some really great presentations. And a huge thank you to Autoglass for sponsoring today's webinar and Jeremy for having you on board for um, the Q&A and the presentation. On the screen now, you can see some of our upcoming events. We do have a webinar next week. Um, which is with DTEC International on tackling drink and drug driving. Um, we've also got our pledge workshops. And um, in December, we've got identifying and addressing driver fatigue with Allianz. So thank you very much again for joining us today. Enjoy the rest of your day and hopefully see you again soon. Thank you very much.